and welcome to the Thread to Men podcast. My name is Taylor and I come to you from Baltimore, Maryland. And this is a podcast about all things that are fiber related. I mostly touch on the subjects of knitting and spinning. Um, as you might be able to tell, I am a cat enthusiast. I have three cats of my own, or I should say our own here in our household. Um, and this is Star Baby Moonchild, whom if you are a returning viewer have met at least once before. Um, and if you're a new viewer, thank you for being here. Um, I tend to ramble. So um, if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up so that other people have the chance to see it. Um, and leave a comment below if there's anything else that you think that I might benefit from knowing, like um, any constructive feedback that you think is helpful. I'm always welcome to hearing. Um, I know sometimes I have a habit of like not showing my projects on screen enough. So I'm going to try to be better at, um, giving you more close-ups and things like that. But, um, feedback is always welcome. Um, I hope that you're well. Um, I have had quite a week since we last met. I've tried to record a couple times. Um, but I think today is a great day to to finally make it happen as I've cast on for both the front and the back um, of Andrea Mowry's Weekender sweater, uh, which I have here. <laughs> um, so not that exciting, but it is um, a, this is the beginning of it, just a simple one by one rib. But can you see this cast on? You see how nice that looks? I will never not do a bottom up sweater without this tubular cast on. It is just the most perfect cast on I have ever known. I think I'll make everything with this cast on. And let me just tell you, it's not that fun. It kind of twists, so counting your stitches, it's not impossible, but it is somewhat challenging. Sorry that the lighting is what it is. It's just, yeah. Um, but it is so worth it. The rewards are worth the effort. Um, and one thing to know about the tubular cast on, which I, I didn't know the first time I had done it, I think because the pattern didn't call for the tubular cast on, and I decided I preferred to do it for whatever reason, I think. I don't know. Um, but uh, when you do the tubular cast on, you go down a needle size from the ribbing. So this pattern, if you weren't already aware, calls for three needle sizes, which um, was honestly one of the first times I've ever read that in a pattern, to go down a needle size for the cast on, and then go up for the ribbing, and then go up from stockinette, which is pretty standard to go down for ribbing. But anyway, um, I thought if you're a new knitter or you haven't tried the tubular cast on, you might be interested to know my thoughts on it. I'm working on my weekender for a friend named Blair. Blair and I met in our formative years of like high school, college age. We actually never overlapped schools that I'm aware of, um, but we have kind of kept in touch through social media and I'm knitting the sweater for her for Rhinebeck weekend. So this will be her Rhinebeck sweater and I'm going up to stay the weekend with her. Hence, I felt like I must cast on the weekender because it just felt so appropriate. And I would have really have liked to find a Hudson Valley yarn to make it in because that is where she lives. And I was really on the fence about it. And then what ended up happening was I just shopped for price because, I don't know, I think I'm generous in, in making the knitting, so I'm allowed to be <laughs> conservative in my spending. Um, but this is being knit in Elsa wool. It's 100% Cormo wool. Um, I believe that their mill is wind or solar operated, so they're a very earth conscious company. And this is the light gray color in um, their sport weight. So this, this pattern calls for a worsted weight yarn. Um, the pattern uses Brooklyn Tweed's shelter yarn, which is a worsted weight woolen spun, I think two ply. 
Hello and welcome to the Thread to Men podcast. My name is Taylor and I come to you from Baltimore, Maryland, and this is a podcast about all things that are fiber related. I mostly touch on the subjects of knitting and spinning. And if you are a new viewer, thank you for being here. Please do subscribe. If you're a returning viewer, thank you so much for coming back, watching this channel. If you enjoy this video, give it a thumbs up so that other people have the chance to catch it on their suggested videos or something. Um, just help, help it spread it into the community. So uh, I have a couple projects I'd love to review with you and a an idea I need some plotting on. So if you have any comments, anything at all, whether it's constructive feedback, anything I could do um, better, or just your simple input on this um, project at hand, do please comment below because I love to read what you have to say and it is important to me. So I am making huge progress on my Yell cardigan. This is a design by Marie Wallen. It's published in her book Shetland and it is quite a large cardigan. I will insert a photo here in case you haven't seen it before. And this is a project that I'm knitting in several different bases of yarn. So if you can see the very bottom of this, um, where can I peek? There we go. Um, if you can see the very bottom row, that is um, Biche and Bouche two ply lamb's wool. It is very, very soft. Then in the second color here, I'm knitting with Phenyl Garn's Rauma yarn, and I really love that base. And then the majority of colors are all but one are Jameson and Smith two ply jumper weight, which is just an absolute staple in my stash. And then I have a pop of color here in the sea foam that is made with Elemental Effects two ply jumper weight. So I'm really enjoying this color work design. It's been really simple and easy to follow so far. I did read ahead on the sleeve instructions and um, I haven't knit a sweater in that method before, so it will be a very new type of project for me. And I think that I might end up finishing this. Um, I don't know. I won't project too much out into the future, but I, I feel like I have enough projects on my needles that I'm holding off on all my cable projects right now, just because I don't know if I have the bandwidth. But um, this has been a really enjoyable knit and one I almost obsess over picking up. Um, I could just knit on this all day long and, and, and have no regrets. <laughs> so um, that's going really well. I just cast on Andrea Mallory's Weekender sweater, um, and I'm making this for a friend, uh, my friend Blair, whom I came to know in my formative years as a teenager um, in high school and sort of college. Um, she contacted me on social media because we've been following each other since then, and she offered me the chance to come stay with her in the Hudson Valley on Rhinebeck weekend. So I got really excited, and I knew that I wanted to make her a Rhinebeck sweater so that um, if she planned to go to the festival with me, she would have one to wear. Honestly, if she didn't want to go to the festival, I would totally understand. Um, they're not always for everyone, but I thought it was really nice of her to um, offer that space and time. So I immediately shopped for yarn and I've shown it to you in the past, but now it is here on my needles. And I must say, I am, I am so far never unimpressed with Elsa wool yarn. Um, I've bought uh, for my daydreamer, which I'm also still working on the fingering weight for this project. I bought the sport weight, even though it calls for a worsted weight yarn. I kind of calculated the, um, you know, every yarn, I'm just going to backtrack a little bit. Every yarn is unique. It's made in a different mill, um, at different times. And so, I mean, as a hand spinner, I know this very well, Yarn, if you have a fixed amount of wool, say 100 grams of wool, you spin it into a yarn, the amount of air in that yarn and the amount of tension and the amount of twist, it's all going to manipulate the length of the yarn, 
even though the amount is the same. You probably already understand that, but what it means is that you're going to have yarn that's thicker or lighter, and that is what changes the fabric most dramatically, I find. So when I'm shopping for yarn, the, I'm looking for my favorite qualities, which are specific to me. They might not be the same qualities that other people prefer. Um, but when I'm shopping for yarn, I like yarn that's light, but not too light. In fact, if it's a fingering weight, sport weight, maybe DK weight, I am happy with it being a little thick. When it's a worsted weight and it's a little thick, I get kind of nervous. It's not really my favorite because I can't, I don't know it that well. I haven't made with a, a lot of things with that type of weight. And so I just have my own preferences, right? But um, the Elsa wool like always shows up for me. It's a really well made yarn. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fiber it's made of. The long staple length I'm exaggerating here, but you know, four to five inch staple on a fiber is going to give you one that is more sturdy and strong than a shorter fiber. And I just feel like this yarn has just the right amount of twists that I enjoy. It's lofty, it's woolen spun, um, but it has, it still feels strong and I just really like it and it's very soft and I knew that if Blair doesn't already wear wool whatever I make for her has to be soft so I'm just gonna let you know here on the internet that if you're trying to find a quality and ecological but also affordable yarn I highly recommend Elsa wool because their price point is very reasonable it's only like 20 or 21 dollars per skein something like that so that afforded me um, the luxury of knitting a garment that is much larger than I normally do. And I realize, I mean, what a privilege it is to be a small body in the knitting sphere because you have so much less money to invest in each garment, so much less time. And I'm just glad for the chance to kind of step out of that and knit something for someone else. Um, right, so that's my weekender. I just cast on the other band. And then of course I will join them in the round and knit the stockinette inside out as it does, which makes it a really interesting project because it's, you know. Yeah, so um, my weekender for Rhinebeck weekend. That is the start of that. And Let's see. Okay. So I, I'm going to, um, I'm going to ask for your input if that's okay. Please do share if you have any. I've been toying with the idea of placing a small wholesale order. I applied for my sales and trade license or whatever it's called in Baltimore city, um, so that I can make wholesale purchases and redistribute products. Um, and the reason why I did that is because I would really like to dye some yarn in my kitchen to potentially sell online, mostly because I want to dye stuff and I'm running out of things on my own and I don't want to buy more stuff for myself. Um, I, at the same time, I want to keep making things and I want to share the things that I make and I want to inspire other people. That's really, that's really what I enjoy most in, in terms of, you know, what I want to put out into this knitting world is, um, the things that I make and inspiration for other people to keep making things. So, um, I really want to dye some yarn and I have no use for more yarn. <laughs> so I'm, I'm like I mentioned, I'm going to place a small order, probably no more than like 30 skeins to start. And I want to make enough in any color so that if someone's interested in making a garment, hopefully they're able to. At the same time, um, I'm nervous because I, have a full-time job. I take it very seriously. I do let myself kind of move beyond the stress of a regular job into the de-stress of a regular job in this economy and 
uh, within the structure of capitalism that we find ourselves in. Um, and so I just really want to diversify the things that I do that bring money into my life. So it's not totally a passion project. I'm thinking like maybe I need to just start now anything at all. Just make something that someone might appreciate enough to purchase. And why why not try? That's all. So I'm going to I'm going to place an order, I think, but I'm going to wait to upload this video um, and hear what some of your thoughts are, because your thoughts are valuable. And so if you do take the time to share, thank you in advance. I have so far been in contact with Green Mountain Spinnery about placing orders. And so I have a little information already about working with them. And there's a few bases that I'm considering ordering. And I have actually with me a couple skeins of them um, because I've bought them at various festivals in the past. So the first one, and I might have, oh, I have it here. I actually already caked, caked this up because I've been planning to cast it on for a minute. There's a couple beret patterns that I'm um, considering making this into. I haven't decided which one yet, um, but I'm going to give you a little close up of this. Sorry if it's a little blown out from the light. You can tell probably that this is a two ply yarn. It's a woolen spun yarn. Um, but here's the thing about Green Mountain Spinnery that's sort of unique. Their carding methods at Green Mountain Spinnery are a woolen prep. So the fibers are carded into a nice cohesive uh, shape where the ends are in any direction. Um, and it creates a very lofty yarn and a very airy and warm yarn because it traps more air. Um, what's unique to Green Mountain Spinnery is that their spinning method is a little bit more of a worsted method than it is a woolen. Um, so it differs from other woolen yarns like Brooklyn Tweed, at, which is milled by Harrisville Designs, I'm sure you know. It me what that means, in my mind, is that it's just a little bit tighter in its ply. And perhaps the plies are just a little bit more spun. It has a little bit of a definition to it. And I have not knit yet with um, Alpaca Elegance from Green Mountain Spinnery. So I really want to start doing that before I place an order. And hopefully I will start before I upload and share this episode with you. So I'll have my own kind of experience with it. But if you have any experiences with this yarn and feedback to give, I would love to hear it because I'm thinking about buying some of this to dye. This is a DK weight yarn. It's distributed in two ounce skeins. So you have to kind of factor that into yardage and price and all of that because two ounces is not the same as 50 grams, <laughs> but um, it's a little more. So the price can look, I don't know. Anyway, I digress. Uh, so this is something I haven't tried. Another yarn that they sell that I am obsessed with. I have bought one sweater quantity in this yarn in the this color. Sorry, it's covered in my hair. This is embarrassing. This color is Tronito 8821. It's Green Mountain Spinnery's um, Sock Art Lana, and just like the others, it's a woolen prep with a worsted spin. And I knit Brian a sweater in this yarn last year or the year before. Love, love, loved it. Sometimes it would split and I'd have to drop down and pick up the second ply that I had dropped. Um, that's my only complaint. Um, but it was, I mean, I've never knit a sweater that wore better. He wears that sweater almost every day and it hasn't pilled like in the slightest. It's just, I think that's the, I think that's what you get when you do the worst wool, when you do the woolen prep and the worsted spin. I think you get a yarn that will not pill. Or maybe it's just the magic of 
this yarn. Um, so I bought a second sweater quantity for myself, actually a really large sweater quantity. I don't really know what I was thinking, except that I thought if I had extra skeins, I won't even mind. I'll know I'll have enough for everything. And if it needs to be a sweater for Brian again, it could be. So I have like six skeins of this and it's the same yarn, um, but this is the color Gris. It's 8886. It is a medium gray. It has some little flecks of white um, throughout and it's preparation. And so it's mildly tweedy. I guess they were both tweedy, but it's a very subtle tweed and it's very consistent. It's almost part of the whole yarn. So it just feel it just feels so good in my hands. In fact, I just feel like I might have to place at least a 10 skein order of this because I love it so much. Um, if you like this yarn too, let me know. If you've had any constructive feedback about choices, do share. Um, and then there was a third option. I'll pull it up on my pad here for you to see. It is almost identical to this, but the exception is it has tensile in it. Lycosil is uh, marketed is marketed under the trade name tensile and a natural derivative of wood pulp from cultivated southern oak and gum trees grown on land unsuitable for grazing. Interesting. So it looks like they sell and I don't have the forms in front of me, but it seems like they sell um, this, both of these yarns, fingering weight and DK weight, in a 50-50 blend of wool and tensile. I've touched it before, I don't have any to show you, but it kind of feels like a wool silk blend, and I think it'd probably be really good for socks because I think that the tensile makes it really strong. It also gives it a very lustrous quality, which is really shiny and it just almost sparkles. And I feel like if there are sock knitters out there that might want to just buy one skein and make a pair of socks with it, they'll have that variety of projects available through um, a wood tensile blend more so than like a two ply wool yarn, but they are all two ply. So, I mean, that might rule out socks as an option anyway. Um, the tensile does make it more of a luxurious product. And I don't know that I want to order too many bases so that I have enough of the same yarn for multiple people to make garment projects. So I feel like I really want to narrow it down to two different bases. Um, and so, there's the fingering weight and the DK weight with alpaca, um, or there's the tensile blend too. So if you've made anything with any of those yarns and you'd love to share any comments, please do share them below. Um, I had been many years ago in contact with Abundant Earth Fiber about wholesale. I hadn't even gotten close to creating a business ID or whatever yet. So I haven't really revisited yet. Um, my memory was that I thought it was too expensive. I think because I was comparing it to like the superwash wool yarn that is kind of like often milled, you know, overseas in factories I've never seen or heard from. <laughs> um, I really want to keep it a domestic product um, in terms of its full production. So I like that Green Mountain Spinnery sources their fiber in the United States and supports farmers. Um, and is milled here. And it's pretty much, I mean, the wool is sourced from the West, so it kind of is sort of all over, but um, Abundant Earth is an amazing mill and they do a really great worsted prep yarn. Um, I've mentioned that I really love their Joseph and Ani. I've made a couple sweaters in that and I have a few samples from when I last inquired. So I might knit a swatch with with them, just because even though I've knit with their yarns before, they're technically different bases. And so I might consider placing two orders if necessary to have a worsted yarn and a woolen yarn, because I think that would give a nice balance to my offering. Um, and so much is done in fingering weight these days that I feel like 
even if I choose two bases, it's possible they might both be fingering weight. Um, so there's that. I, um, I don't know what else there is to share. Um, but I'm glad that you're here and I'm, uh, oh, I do, I do have one more thing. My friend Yvonne, whom I met at the yoga studio in Pikesville when I worked there and I taught there, she would come to my class every Friday. Um, and she has moved to Delaware, but she did not forget me. And she mailed me this book and a beautiful card. And it said, it informed me that she's been volunteering at this book swap and she came across this and she knew that there was no one else who would appreciate it more than me. And so she mailed this off to me and I haven't had a chance yet to even dive in, but boy, am I excited to have some guidance in this world of natural dying. I do comb the internet for info um, and I peek people's photos but there's always questions to be had and this one is i think just full of answers and i really do enjoy foraging for dye materials i have no problem doing that in baltimore city because uh, for the most part people are just littering they're too busy to be foraging themselves so there's almost no possibility that i'm over uh consuming things from our area, at least within Baltimore. I've had uh, good luck foraging mulberries and pokeberries, which I won't actually do pokeberries ever again. It's not light fast, so it just fades. Like, not, there's nothing you can do. It's just going to happen. <laughs> um, but I foraged black walnut hulls, and I'm sure there's so much more stuff too. Um, English ivy is something I've done. I might have experimented with Virginia creeper before, but every other time that I've naturally dyed wool, I have very often kind of just rushed the process a little and I, I never really let things soak overnight or over days. And um, I... I think I want to be more adventurous in my approach to different batches because I think that if I were to let things sit a little longer and not rush the process of finishing, then I'll have different colors that I never would have made before. So I'm really excited to dive into this book. Um, I do enjoy resource books like this um, more than I enjoy sitting down to read a book. So I'm excited. <laughs> um, I'm going to eventually get to studying this. And um, yeah, so that's it. That's all I have for this week's episode of the Threads Men podcast. Um, my name's Taylor E. Owen on social media, uh, whether it's Ravelry or Instagram, you can find me there as Taylor E. Owen. I hope you will connect with me on one of those two platforms. I enjoy engaging on both, so don't hesitate to reach out. And I will see you all in the next episode. I hope that you're well and you take care.